All right, good afternoon. My name is Errol Schweitzer. I am moderating the final panel of the Reforming Retail Conference. I apologize that I was not able to attend in person. I was at Natural Products Expo West this week, uh, which is the grocery industry's largest trade show, and I am wiped out. <laughs> and uh, this has been a refreshing change, and I want to just appreciate all the presenters and moderators. Um, as somebody who is uh, active in the grocery industry for a really uh, compelling um, and interesting uh, set of information. Uh, so my name is Errol. Um, I've been in the food industry for almost 28 years now from um, starting as a grill cook, stock clerk. I was the uh, VP of grocery uh, for seven years at Whole Foods where I actually spent over 14 years. Um, for the last six years, I've been a board member and advisor to about 25 different uh, food companies. I've spent my time in category management, uh, supply chain pricing strategy, um, working on organic regenerative uh, products, local brands, uh, diverse uh, founders, um, as well as production standards uh, and certifications. Um, I was given the uh, Retail Game Changer of the Year Award by Supermarket News a couple years back and have also been recognized with the Hemp Industry Association Lifetime Award for my work in hemp and cannabis, can, uh, can, cannabis decriminalization and legalization. I've consulted for national co-op grocers and several other food, food co-ops. I've actually been a member of the Wheatsville co-op here in Austin for uh, around a decade. I actually started out my retail career in a food co-op at uh, State University of New York in Binghamton, a student-run volunteer co-op. I am currently on the City of Austin Food Policy Board, uh, where I've been active in municipal food policy for close to a decade. I also have a podcast called The Checkout, where I cover many of the issues that are being discussed here. And I have a frequent Forbes column. In the last couple of months, I've covered issues on antitrust, inflation, uh, food insecurity, uh, pricing strategy, uh, technology, as well as a uh, real focus on labor dynamics and, uh, and work organizing. Our presenters are a fantastic group. Um, Ellen Walsh Rosman is a graduate of Iowa State University and is an organic farmer with her husband, Daniel in Harlan, Iowa. Ellen also owns a local food hub called Farm Table Procurement and Delivery that works with small farms from Iowa and Eastern Nebraska to aggregate and deliver their products to wholesale markets. Ellen and Daniel also own Milk and Honey, a farm to table restaurant in Harlan. Since the pandemic, Ellen assumed the position of Director of Wellness, Food Service and Nutrition at Harlan Community Schools. She is passionate about food system, revitalizing rural America and food justice work. J.D. Shulton is a former professional baseball player and two-time congressional candidate in Iowa's fourth district. He is a fifth generation Iowan, first generation to be raised in town. He continues to be an advocate for rural communities. Currently, he serves as a senior advisor to the American Economic Liberties Project. Robert Lavalva is a placemaking consultant and creative director who builds connections between food systems, economic development, and public space. He trained as an architect at the Harvard Graduate School of Design and began his career in New York City, where he helped create and implement the nation's largest urban composting program. In 2005, he established New Amsterdam Market, a reinvention of the public market dedicated to promoting sustainable food businesses and revitalizing New York's oldest commons on the East River waterfront in Lower Manhattan. Robert works with government organizations, cultural institutions, and the private sector. Nathan Beacom is founding director of the Lyceum Movement in Des Moines, Iowa, he is also a writer and journalist on agriculture, environment, and rural issues. He has worked on state level food and grocery policy in Nebraska, as well as regulatory policy in the federal level in Washington, DC. Benya Kraus is the executive director of Lead for Minnesota, an affiliate of Lead for America, where she was a co-founder. She serves on the board of directors of the Citizens League, was appointed to the Minnesota Young Women's Cabinet and the Governor's Workforce Development Board and is involved in her community as a board member of the Wasika Area Foundation. And Jay Novin is deeply committed to collective governance and action, has spent the last six years cultivating both while managing a volunteer run retail grocery store, the Berkeley Student Food Collective, where they serve as executive director. It's one of the largest student communities at UC Berkeley, the cheapest grocery store in the Bay Area's poorest neighborhood, and increasingly a site of militant based or structured organizing education and practice. Novin also organizes for community ownership as contract staff in the network of Bay Area worker cooperatives, is a Justice Democrats Movement School fellow, a co-founder of Monterey County's 
Winning Municipal Reinvestment Campaign, Community Before Cops, and wrote two theses on retail cooperative development at UC Berkeley. So we're gonna get the uh, panel started with regional food hubs, adding flexibility and resiliency to the food supply system by J.D. Shulton and Ellen walsh Rosman. This is really interesting because it, it, it shows, if you can't see on the far left is 1920 and what they grew on farms then, and then it comes up to 1997 and it really hasn't changed too much uh, from 1997 to today. But the, the really interesting thing for me is the, the green section is the top section. That's what it's grown on more than 50% of farms in Iowa, the, the thing. So, so uh, we see in the first column in 1920, it was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. And about 10 things that were 50 farms, 50% 50 of farms in Iowa was growing. Now it's corn and soybeans. So uh, a lot has changed. So the, it's been a decline in diversity. Uh, when you think about Iowa, you'd probably think about agriculture and 88% of our land in Iowa is used for growing crops. The interesting thing is 90% of the food that Iowa consumes is actually imported. I mean, think about that. And when I ran for Congress, it was in the second most agriculture producing district in America. And there was only two farm to table restaurants, hers and, and one other one. And where I live in Sioux City, uh, even though we're an economic hub, uh, we are um, an immigrant meatpacking town since the 1880s, we really lack um, a lot of food diversity. Um, and, and on the campaign trail, I re realized that there's a lot of towns that you cannot buy a fresh vegetable in, in, yet we have all this land around us that we grow for stuff. So one example we, we kind of used was the apple in Iowa. Uh, long time ago, uh, in the early 1900s, or, or yeah, um, we were six in the nation in apple production. And then in 2004, we were ranked 31st. And so the, the big difference there is, is when you go to a grocery store right now, uh, I, in fact, I went last week and you could get a apple from New Zealand and that's 8,000 miles away. Um, think about how much that has traveled. Think about the uh, refrigeration storage and, and all that. And, and it gets to our uh, story down the road when we talk about climate change. And um, it, it, the other part of it is 60% of apple juice consumed in the state of Iowa is, uh, or I'm sorry, in, in America, 60% of apple juice consumed comes from China. Again, think about the economic part of it and think about the climate part of that. Okay, so what should we do? Um, for the last few decades, there has been an increase in local regional food, um, direct to consumer sales of regional foods has risen from 0.4 billion in 1992 to 1.3 in 2012, obviously that's data is 10 years old. Um, as the general industry has consolidated and pushed toward efficiency, these local mar markets have existed outside of the mainstream market. Um, infrastructure to create local food markets could be inv uh, invested for pennies on the dollar of what the federal government spends on current food systems. So Iowa is a large um, receiver of especially Title I and insurance and other farm bill um payments and you know if somebody gave my food hub a half a million dollars the economic impact that would have um, we've done studies uh, for every dollar we spend four dollars goes back into the economy so it really has an impact um, so what is a food hub they can be mission and business oriented uh, there's all sorts they're different models. They are hybrid. They're maybe just doing wholesale. Maybe they're doing direct to consumer. Um, they could be a nonprofit. They could be a for profit. There's so many different models of a food hub, and it just it doesn't matter what it looks like. But the mission is the same, right? the The money needs to go to the farmer directly. And yes, the food hub kind of acts as a middleman, but um, like. My food hub, for instance, um, we let the farmers decide what their price is. Um, we we don't want to undercut them, and they know what what it costs to produce the food. 
So the USDA definition of a food hub is a centrally located, centrally located facility with business management structure facilitating the aggregation, storage, processing, and distribution, and or marketing of locally regional produced food products by actively co coordinating these activities along the value chain. Food hubs are providing wider access to institutional and retail markets for small to mid-sized producers and increasing access of fresh, fresh healthy food for consumers, including underserved areas and food deserts. So in the county that I live in, um, we have a food desert and here we are living in the breadbasket of America. Um, none of the farmers actually grow food. Um, uh, in Iowa, a majority of our food or our crops are to uh, drive fuel our cars and to feed livestock. We heard all this earlier today, so we don't need to get into the weeds about all that. Um, so, um, let's see, next one. Yeah, go ahead. That's fine. Okay. So, um, there's three really major things, or three important things that we really went into on why a regional food system would really help out. Right now, our current food system is very efficient, but the pandemic really put a spotlight on how uh, the lack of flexibility and lack of adaptability. So uh, regional food systems can really be beneficial in these three ways. One is, the first one's decentralizing the food system. Second is rural uh, economic development. And the third is combating climate change. So the first one, uh, decentralizing the food system, um, there was a fire in fall of 2019 in Holcomb, uh, Kansas. And uh, you'd think a fire at one processing plant is, I mean, it's bad, but like it, it shouldn't affect the whole economy uh, in the beef industry. But we're, since we're so concentrated, um, this is one of the, it's the, tied for the second largest um, processing plant in America, beef processing plant, the, the largest ones across the river from where I live. And, um, but, but that disrupted the whole market. You have the JBS uh, cyber attacks that disrupted the market. Uh, and then just last month, you had a Mexican cartel that um, uh, threatened an inspection or inspector uh, down in Mexico for avocados. And now we have a ban on Mexican avocados. And it just shows how concentrated uh, our food system is. And I believe that's a national security threat. So, why do I do all the things I do? It's because I believe in my local community and I want my children to have playmates and I wanna revitalize uh, the, the countryside. I wanna fill the church pews and um, help increase the rural school population. Um, where I live, we are seeing the um, implications of our current food system and um, decrease in, in those things. Um, and I believe that a local and regional food system will help uh, repopulate the local countryside. You know, smaller farms that maybe maybe need a little bit more labor um, can help with those things. Our farm alone, um, my husband, who's in the back here, he works full time with his father. Um, my mother in law also works full time, and my brother in law. And we have a small farm, so. Uh, really trying to capitalize on uh, the limited amount of land and how uh, the value of increasing the value of that um, limited um, input, right? Um, jobs are also important. So, um, sorry, I'm just going to read it from here. Um, food hubs are resilient. They have a, a very high survival rate. Um, most food hubs work with an average of 70 farms. So if you think about how many farms those uh, the, are employing, maybe how many employees those farms are employing, and um, a large amount of the food hubs that we, or excuse me, the farmers that we work with are very reliant on their income coming from the food hub. So we're helping support their employees as well as we do have employees at our food hub. There, there's a, one thing on the rural economic uh, side that I, I do want to address. In, in Iowa State University, um, economic professor said that uh, if Iowans um, for three months ate the five daily servings of fruits and vegetables that are from Iowa, uh, it would add 302 uh, 
$4.4 million to our economy and 4, uh, 000, over 4,000 jobs to the economy as well. Um, and that's just, we're missing out on that right now. Uh, then the third part, the climate change part. So in the state of Iowa, the last four years, we've had, uh, in 2019, we had major flooding that caused uh, climate refugees in the state of Iowa. Uh, we had the derecho, which cost $7.5 billion, uh, which was the, the costliest thunderstorm in US history. Uh, last December, we had tornadoes, which is a very rare occurrence. And just last week, we had an F3 tornado uh, in uh, this time of year, which is also unheard of. Um, so you look at, uh, again, I a lot of this goes to the transportational costs and, and uh, the large em emission of uh, carbon. So as of 2017, 39% of fruits, 12% of vegetables, and 70% of uh, fish and uh, shellfish consumed in the US were imported. So in, on average, the typical American meal contains ingredients from at least five different countries. So then how do we make these changes? The first thing I think is well addressed, especially here, is antitrust. We feel that nothing can change unless we start holding some of these multinational corporations uh, check. And until we do so, we're not going to combat climate change. We're not going to have rural development the way we should, and we're not going to decentralize our food system. So one of the biggest expenses for a food hub is infrastructure. You need to have delivery vehicle, freezer, storage, uh, coolers. Um, you are operating on the thin, thinnest of margins. You're operating on the same margin that Cisco is. Um, we've never reached zero with our uh, food hub. Um, so it's hard to invest in that infrastructure. Um, so you know, maybe the maybe this is being supported by state, even local, federal government, but at the same time, it's um, hard when you are managing and you are a practitioner to apply for those grants and those funding sources. Um, applying for a federal grant, you know, people do that full time. Um, so. Um, in Iowa too, we don't have uh, LTL trucking. It's not a very vibrant uh, infrastructure that's taking place like you would find on the East and West Coast. So um, that's always something that's hanging over um, our heads is if the truck uh, breaks down, what are we going to do to get the product to market? Um, so maybe it could be a state run, uh, um, logistics so piggybacking on um, the prison industries uh, logistics or the state uh, liquor and beer warehousing maybe we're using those uh, to help get small um, pallets worth of food to places um, there also could be cohesive branding of local products uh, to uh, legitimize them and kind of help support the how important they are um, and funding would be from like dairy council, the beef producers, the egg producers, and uh, using checkoff dollars to help um, fund a, a statewide cohesive branding project. Um, and then, um, so I work at the school and I deal a lot with procurement and, um, uh, and we've heard a lot about school food and such and, um, Sometimes your hands are tied, but it's also very overwhelming on how to procure local food. So if you had some sort of technical assistance to help you write your procurement plan or just let you know that, yes, you can use your micro purchasing to purchase your your local food to, um, you know, a lot of people don't know that Iowa is doing a really good job on supporting uh, school food service directors on what that looks like, but you could also um, maybe you do the reimbursement. Um, so right now from the federal government, we get $4.53 per lunch meal and $1.70, I think it is for breakfast. Why not get um, some more of that reimbursement is if you are serving local food um, in your meals, in your menus. Then uh, farm bill reform. Uh, I think a lot of folks in this room understand what's happening with the farm bill, but. Uh, 
one thing that we noted was just six crops receives 94% of all subsidies, and that's corn, rice, wheat, soy, cotton, and peanuts. So we need to add diversity uh, to that. Um, when it comes to the how to deal with the cost, I thought uh, the keynote really did a good job uh, talking, uh, addressing this specific uh, issue. And then just to conclude. So in conclusion, regional food systems are more resilient to economic pressures. So we saw that in the pandemic, we uh, food systems, regional food systems were able to adapt very quickly, um, just in a matter of days compared to um, non regional food systems. Um, and, uh, and then like respond to the local stakeholder needs. So if our customers are telling us to grow a certain variety of kale, then we will do that. It doesn't take R&D and market research and all this crazy amount of money to figure that out. Um, and then success is measured by feeding the market, right? And um, how many people are buying the food and from us, um, again, we don't have to, it's not complicated. Um, and uh, regional um, food systems need to be supported by local, state, and federal funding in order to remain sustainable. Um, it's it's a like i said earlier it's a very low margin razor thin margin you don't have much money to invest back into um your business if you will and um it can only sustain itself if it is funded um local state and federally so thank you um why don't we go to our next two panelists, uh, Nathan Beacom and Benya Krauss with creating conditions for cooperative groceries and food markets. So looking forward to this presentation. Looking Thanks to back. Austin and to everybody who helped put this on. We appreciate having the opportunity to talk here. Um, so first off, um, the question is kind of why co-ops as opposed to other ownership models or forms of, of uh, organization. And although we titled it co-ops, we're also actually talking about kind of a broader conception of community ownership because um, some communities opt for many member LLCs or other structures that aren't strictly cooperatives but have some of the same benefits. And our motivation for community ownership comes from also sort of a rural perspective, which is the background of both Benya and, and my work. Um, in Nebraska, where I've worked on food policy, um, for instance, there were in 2000 something like 1600 independent grocery stores. Uh, in 2020, there were something on the order of 430. So uh, in Iowa, in a similar period of time, almost half of our grocery stores disappeared. So um, the loss is pretty um, hard to calculate. And so um, that being said, one of the chief motivations for community ownership is retention of stores or starting new stores in places that might not make economic sense for um, one of the larger chains. Um, so uh, that can be difficult to do in a small town, especially a very small town where one single person might not have all the capital or be willing to take on all the risk that's involved with starting the store. Community ownership offers a chance for those people to pool their capital and to kind of distribute some of that risk. So in a town like Cody, Nebraska, which has a population of something like 247, and its town motto is the town that refused to die, um, nobody is going to serve Cody. It's in a county, an enormous county that has like 800 people in it. Nobody's going to build a store there unless Cody does it itself. So um, in towns like that, um, it has a particular use, but also in larger towns on the order of 10,000 or 25,000 people, um, where you might get a Dollar General or there might be a Walmart in the, vic the vicinity, but that's your only option. Um, the second kind of motivation has to do with um, the economic benefit, which is to say that um, these chain stores are extractive in ways that we've heard uh, described today, where um, community ownership returns the um, returns themselves to the community, and these stores are also more likely to pay into that short supply chain and local uh, regional food system that we heard about, which has a positive multiplier for uh, total economic output and employment in that region. Uh, and then finally, uh, also to the point of the previous presentation, um, to resiliency. Um, it's the shorter supply chains and local ownership 
um, create alternative paths to the concentrated supply chains that we've seen so many vulnerabilities in. Um, in Nebraska, we already heard about the, the Fremont uh, chicken plant that serves everything west of the Mississippi. That's kind of egregious. And um, for that reason, uh, the Biden administration put out an executive order to support these alternative structures uh, for the sake of resiliency. So for this paper, we talked to uh, a number of co-op grocery store managers um, in the upper Midwest about what were the things that were difficult for them, what made it difficult for them to grow. Um, and Benya is going to describe some of those things. Yeah, so if you're looking for a lot of words, you can read our paper, but what we wanted to do with this presentation was actually show you some of the photos of, of the from the co ops that we visited. Um, and, you know, like Nathan said, this presentation will talk about some of the, the challenges, best practices, and then, you know, deducing from that some of the policy recommendations. Um, and uh, so there's a handful here. We are also including research done by the University of Minnesota Extension. They actually did this whole case study uh, research paper. It's awesome. You can find it online that is looking at those three digit towns and co-ops that have succeeded there. So um, uh, we're pairing that with also research uh, from Nebraska and and again, these, these co-ops that we visited. I say that because we're focusing on rural grocery co-ops and you'll see that the population sizes totally vary so I, I i disclaimer rochester in my neck of the woods would not be seen as rural but you'll see just population sizes moving around um before going ahead i also just wanted to lift up the story here in terms of just why community ownership this is a photo from uh aberdeen co-op in aberdeen south dakota you'll see that it says the best water in town uh, what was very unique about their co-op uh, is that they had a, a reverse osmosis water system. And when we asked the general manager why, uh, she said that it's because uh, this town doesn't have drinkable water. And in fact, the neighboring uh, Indian reservation also does not. So there are people that come from, you know, up as, uh, as far as North Dakota across Indian reservation to come to this co-op that's been in, in existence for about 40 years in order to have uh, jugs of water. And you'll kind of see this theme of how each co-op is different and catering to that local need, but just another kind of reason for why local ownership. Uh, the first, uh, again, best practices, but also a lot of challenge around uh, opening up co-ops is definitely the human capital. So this is a co-op in New Ulm, Minnesota, about 40 minutes from where I live, population 13,000. Um, and when we asked this general manager, if you could have, you know, change one thing or have one thing to really make your co-op succeed, what would it be? And again, I think at first you're thinking, what's the policy recommendation? She ended up telling us, I just need more board members. Uh, there's about 30, I think, board members uh, that are still around operating this cooperative. Uh, she was there um, working, you know, a several hour shift as a total volunteer. And so uh, they don't yet have a paid general manager. And this was an example of, you know, just the, the challenges of both recruiting, but also developing the human capital. Um, I'm glad Nathan gave a shout out to the NCG sweatshirt because, uh, you know, they she wasn't familiar that there were, you know, these technical assistance organizations either, you know, from the extension system or through NCG. But um, what is really neat, NCG as well as Food FCI, Food Co-op Institute, I think that's the name of that, um, provide startup guides for co-ops to be able to, you know, train up who the general manager is, tell the board how they need to structure their subcommittees, what they need to be thinking about. And actually in their recommendations is that before you even do feasibility studies is to do a visioning process with your community. So again, the, the capital intensity is both a challenge, but in many ways also a best practice because the, the process of the community visioning, the training, um, if you invest in that from the front end, that's what we've seen as, you know, the, the trends of the most successful co-ops. Um, but again, the, the challenge is also there's an inflection point of when you, you know, recruit your, your board members as volunteers of how to then shift into a space where you can actually pay your workers a living wage and also be recruiting at the caliber of a general manager. Um, you know, again, as we were working and listening to all these co-ops, it differed between, you know, some co-ops had a general manager that was, you know, turning over every two to three months and how hard and challenging that is then to create the actual systems um, so that it can succeed financially. 
So with that, some recommendations that came out of our, our conversations are. Okay, so this first one has to do with that, uh, that issue of technical assistance. USDA has a cooperative, de de cooperative development uh, center grant program that exists right now, but it's not very well funded. Um, this new home store was not aware that there was any kind of assistance uh, for cooperative development in the state. Uh, and I think that speaks to the fact that the cooperative development center in Minnesota has not been able to reach this struggling cooperative. Um, and so the first recommendation is to more fully fund that grant program because in states where uh, these centers are effective, like Nebraska and Montana, there are a good number of these successful cooperatives whose existence is attributable to uh, technical advising and helping a community walk through each step of the process. Um, they don't have any training in Newham on merchandising, on purchasing, on marketing, on a lot of the normal things you would need to have a grocery store. So that access to training on that uh, is very important. This is the same, <laughs> is the same point, yeah. Great. Um, the second challenge we found was um, you know, of course, financing and uh, getting access to financing structures. So the, uh, the co-ops that we spoke to uh, shared that they felt sometimes that they were in this gray area where, uh, you know, they are, they're, they're not a nonprofit, so they're exempt from many uh, grant programs around, you know, food access and food sustainability, yet also at the same time, a lot of traditional loan structures weren't available to them either. Uh, one that we uh, heard most specifically, this is a you know, photo taken from the Sioux Falls, South Dakota co-op, incredibly successfully run. Um, and this is actually in a facility that they just bought uh, and expanded into. And as he was talking about just the financing structure of how to you know, finance such a huge expansion like this, uh, he could speak to, you know, both the challenges, but also, you know, the level of technical assistance required to understand the debt to asset ratio and how to leverage your membership, um, your co-op membership uh, fees, you could say, as a, a, being able to use them as shareholders and, and figure out that debt to asset uh, ratio to be able to successfully um, apply to and submit loans. He also mentioned as well that um, the Small Business Administration has loans, but ask for a personal guarantee as part of that loan access. And when you're structured as a co-op, um, it means that you need to have one of your essentially like board members um, or collection of your board members provide that personal guarantee, which again, you know, when you have as many members here and when it's also locally owned, some of those structures, again, are just not made to be as accessible for, for, for co-op uh, financing. Yeah, so the first policy recommendation we have here is um, there's state level programs and you can find examples across the country of uh, grant programs or tax incentives that are there to incentivize cooperative development. Um, states uh, have determined that there's something in the public interest to stores that are operated and owned this way. Um, and uh, so the first is to encourage more states to adopt these programs. We gave two examples. Um, and these are programs not just for grocery stores and we talk about cooperative food systems um, that also involves the distribution produce, production and packaging that go to the supply chain that fills the store um, and so that's what um, these two programs do the next thing just follows from that that point about sba's personal guarantee requirement it just effectively bars cooperatives from accessing that financing. So this cooperative in Sioux Falls uh, wanted to add a prepared food section and a dining area uh, and had to find alternative routes to do it. Um, there's been debate in Congress and in the agencies about how to do this. Um, and uh, last year, Senator Hickenlooper introduced a bill to replace the personal guarantee with uh, an evaluation of the soundness of, of a given store's business model. So that would be an alternative. And speaking of that uh, prepared food section, um, again, both best practices and challenges that we learned uh, was um, the challenges. Uh, first, maybe I'll, I'll talk about the value adds. Um, in terms of best practices, what we found, you know, hearkening back to the Aberdeen example, is that a a great asset of a co-op structure is that you are responsive to your community's needs, and so you know. Um, you know, what would it take for this uh, co-op to, you know, 
not just compete with Walmart, right, but offer something just fundamentally different. And what we heard was that, um, you know, just replicating another grocery model oftentimes would not get you there. Um, actually always would not get you there and and what co-ops uh, what you can find is you know a section on bulk buying or a section on um, so bulk buy and uh, natural food supplements and things like that were often the highest yielding uh, um, parts of their of their co-op also things like having a prepared food section and also a dine-in uh, seating place uh, gives it also a, another essence to what the co-op is um, and you know i'm excited to hear about the presentation around the civic purpose too uh, because in those co-ops where you know they had the structure to be able to support that you could see that this was not just a grocery store but a community hub um, in a place where events took place uh, in some of the co-ops we you know saw and, and read about that had um, uh, community kitchens in there that would do uh, education offerings that they knew that their community perhaps didn't quite uh, know how to prepare uh, a fresh meal that that's you know they would have their FFA or their extension office do free classes or their community ed do free classes where you can actually teach you know your residents how to cook that that healthy meal. Um, a really interesting example out in Pelican Rapids, Minnesota, there's a nearby reservation, the White Earth community, um, and they partnered with them to uh, do food kits where you would have um, recipes about different native dishes and they would sell those products that were grown on the reservation and prepare those kits that people could come and pick up. So again, just the, the best practice is finding out what makes your co-ops uh, reflect the nature and identity of your community and being able to incorporate, incorporate that in your design. Um, challenges to that uh, is, uh, you know, the tax structure, Nathan will get into it, but the tax structure of, um, you know, preparing processed foods is also challenging. So that Aberdeen example shared with us that they needed a permit to even cut a cantaloupe in half in order to put those on their shelves because it fell into the, the prepared food category. Um, also a big challenge is bargaining power. So uh, some of the main distributors, uh, that they uh, that each of our co-ops had were you know um, about like 20 percent of their uh, local supply were coming in from producers around that but um, you know they were also uh, bringing in other conventional distributors too to be able to meet their their customer demand so you know distributors like UNFI for example and you know some would say when we first began we had uh, you know we could almost exclusively sell this good but over time you know we would see um, uh, Walmart also carrying that same price or carrying that same product. So how can we also increase in the bargaining power of, of co-ops? Yeah, so our recommendations here are first, there's not only additional regulations if you prepare food, but also additional taxes. So if you sold like a slice of ham, a piece of cheese and a piece of bread, it would you'd be taxed less than if you put those on top of each other and gave them to a customer. But you're gonna make more money with prepared foods. Your margins are way better and that's a, a distinctive for your store too. So remove the prepared food tax for uh, independent stores. And then the grocery tax still exists in 13 states, which is uh, regressive. And that's why most states have gotten rid of it, should also go away. Um, and then uh, finally, as was just kind of hinted at, and I'll just hint at it again here, um, for prices to be competitive in the store and for cooperatives not to be um, a bougie niche thing, um, there needs to be supply chains and distribution lines that have a similar level of efficiency to what other stores have. And so one way of doing that is these various cooperatives like this one are themselves member owners of the larger cooperative National Co-op Grocers, which is able to uh, negotiate sale prices and they work with a cooperative distributor, which also can get them uh, goods uh, more consistently and at um, at um, cheaper prices. And lastly, I'll just end real quick by um, you know giving this example here of a of a, um, a locally owned grocery in New Prague, Minnesota. Um, they are not actually structured as a co-op, but pride themselves and are seen by the community as being community owned. And this was an example that fell out of, again, you know, our, our co-op structure, but 
what they do is they have a 24 seven uh, operating grocery that is membership based. So members can come in with a fob. And, uh, you know, I know we had a, a kind of panel on private data sharing that this is, you know, self, uh, it has the technology to be, you know, self checkout, but I, I can guarantee you that the, the technology is pretty limited. Um, but what it, they do allow you to do is at any point in time coming in to um, pick up groceries that you wouldn't be able to get anywhere else in the community. And because again, you know, leveraging the small town, uh, uh, you know, shared identity, they meet with every uh, member that comes in and no one's incentivized to steal as well because you're stealing from one another. Um, so I wanted to end with that last example here because what we also heard, uh, especially in the rural context, is that sometimes the word co-op already throws people off of saying that's not for us. Um, and the comparison is to, you know, high prices, hoity-toity um, sort of living. And so when we could frame the conversation instead around community ownership um, of how can you drive the food choices in your community, uh, we have found that these co-ops and, and other ones like it and potentially in the future could really benefit from that framing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nathan and Benya. That was a wonderful presentation, one that was very close to my heart. Our next presentation is from Robert Lavalva, uh, titled Public Markets, Antitrust and Food Systems. On to you, Robert. All right, let's hope it works this time. Uh, share. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Well, thanks again to uh, Austin for uh, inviting me to this conference and to all the conference organizers. It's really been a terrific event uh, and I appreciate being part of it. I, I'm very sorry I can't be there in person. I'm literally awaiting the results of a COVID test. So I thought it'd be better not to, not to show up. Um, so we've been talking about supermarkets and, and when I reviewed all of the, uh, the, the great papers that were submitted at this conference, what, uh, what came out is that supermarkets seem to be engaged in uh, uh, various anti-competitive uh, practices. Uh, not being a lawyer, I would actually say unethical practices, but, um, but uh, you know, in the end, it's not really a, much of a surprise because the supermarkets are part of the supply chain where all of the other links of the supply chain are equally uh, you know, consolidating and, um, and um, engaged in anti-competitive behavior. So it stands to reason that when you're part of a system like that, then that's how you'll behave yourself. Uh, but my interest is in public markets and uh, I should first of all, define what they are. There is no, no one, like same thing with food hubs, there's no one legal or universal definition of public markets, but in general, they are um, understood to have uh, multiple independent businesses. And that's a very important aspect of the markets. You know, the, the sections of, of supermarkets today are actually derived from the, uh, the, how public markets used to be, but with the exception that though in the public markets, those were in you know multiple butchers, multiple grocers, multiple fishmongers. Uh, in the supermarkets, it's just the appearance of that, um, and that they're independent. They're not. They're not chains. Uh, the other aspect of public markets is that they are in a public setting. They are themselves a form of public space. In fact, public markets existed long before there were such things as urban parks. So they've always been a place for community and for gathering. And that they have a civic aim. Um, I think historically that civic aim was to provide food for the community, but in more recent years, public markets have been created to, for the number of different missions, whether it's to revitalize neighborhoods or to provide sales outlets to, to farms and, and, um, and uh, help preserve farmland. Those are some of the uh, civic aims of public markets. Um, I would say just for these reasons alone, public markets, already in a way are an embodiment of antitrust because they are comprised of multiple small businesses that are competing with each other, but that are you know, not, not merging and not acquiring and not growing. And so that just for that one reason alone, they already represent the ideal of antitrust. But I would say as well that the um, civic aim of a public market could also be to help further the aims of antitrust. Public markets also have 
a number of important attributes, uh, and there are three in particular that I that I uh, wrote about in my paper, and that I that I'll mention today. Uh, one of them is engagement. A public market is a public space where people interact with each other, whether it's the uh, vendor and the um, and the customer, or whether it's the community that itself forms around the market. But public markets have always been places where people converse and talk and uh, do business and uh, are engaged with each other. And uh, to contrast that with the industrial food system, um, I'll just bring up the example of Amazon Go, which was talked about today. And you have engagement. Uh, you don't need to talk at all when you're there. You could just check out on your own and engagement is replaced with surveillance. Um, that's a lot of cameras actually. Um, order or regulation is another really important aspect of public markets since, uh, since uh, time uh, immemorial, public markets are known for having rules and for the enforcement of those rules. And this is just one, it's a print from 1831 of a chron uh, someone chronicled uh, an event where the market master of the uh, city of York in Pennsylvania was seizing and confiscating um, butter from a farmer because he was, it was a uh, lightweight butter. So he was cheating his customers and the fraud was made was exposed and made public and remedied in front of everyone to see. Uh, and I would contrast that to today, where you have other types of fraud, which are much more subtle. I mean, this is one example that that I personally care about. But you have, you can pick up a carton of Horizon organic milk and look at the writing on it, and it talks about you know only six percent of U.S. milk is USDA organic, and it's uh, pasture raised. But if uh, more likely than not, the milk came from a CAFO like this, and I would not call that pasture. Um, and I know, of course, that legally speaking, uh, they have found a way to, to define their milk as organic nonetheless, but ethically speaking, it's not organic. And, uh, and that, but the, the problem, you know, is that um, how do you fight something like that? It's such a, it's on such a remote, removed scale. It's such a uh, intangible thing. You do have groups like the Real Organic Project is now trying to reinforce the original notion of organic, which means animals not confined. But it's and and I think they're doing a great job. But it's a very challenging thing to try to you know uh, uh, address or correct something as universal as the USDA organic label. And finally, democracy. Public markets have always been places where everybody congregates. Uh, this is a print from Fulton Market in New York in, in the 19th century, and you can see a whole, you know, people from all walks of life, uh, kids in bare feet with raggedy clothes and men with top hats and spats. Uh, there's African Americans here. The public markets were really one of the few places where everybody congregated, of, you know, all people, all incomes, all backgrounds. Uh, that's really part of the history of public markets. And what's um, what's more, though, is that while they were places for everybody, they were also considered you know, sort of monumental parts of the city. This is an engraving of Fulton Market when it was first built, and it, you could see that it has a kind of premise of being a palace for the people. Um, they were celebrated. Uh, this is the, the opening of the, what, of the Fulton Fish Market, a uh, new building in, in the 1940s. Uh, it was an occasion for a, of a public ceremony. Um, this, you know, kind of sadly came across my desk the other day. It's a public market in Kiev, uh, probably long gone, but it was, it's a postcard. So, you know, something that you would remember the city by is, is its public markets. And that I would contrast to uh, Dollar General stores, which were also discussed today, where never mind putting them on a postcard, cities are trying to, uh, you know, create ordinances against them for all of the damage they do. So it's hardly the notion of a universal democratic place where everyone can buy food. Uh, these, these are sort of the negative uh, version of that. But I would say that that being said, the maybe the age of public markets, which have been around since there have been cities, is not yet over. Uh, I was very uh, fortunate to be involved with this project. It was a relocation of an old municipal market in New York City called the Essex Market in the Lower East Side. It was moved literally across the street into a new site that was part of a big urban renewal project and uh, it opened its doors in 19, uh, 2019. And the market is really elevates the experience of buying food for everybody who, who walks in there. Uh, and some important aspects of it are that the, uh, because it was built all at once and all the vendors from the old market were moved into the new space as, and joined by just as equal number of new vendors, it was built 
built all at one time. So everybody got the same uh, furnishings and the same fixtures and the same uh, quality of materials and the same kind of overall uh, signage above their stalls. And I, and I find that very important because if you look at the composition of the market, this is a floor plan of, of Essex market, of the new market, uh, really about half of the market is vendors who sell very affordable food. Um, so it's, you could say it's a very inclusive place. And in fact, of all of those vendors, five of them, it's three groceries, a butcher and a uh, fishmonger, uh, probably about half of their sales is uh, EBT or food stamps. So they are very much serving a, a low income community. Um, and not only that, but the unlike the dollar stores or the convenience stores, these grocery stores, while they do, of course, have convenience products, they and packaged goods, they also do sell a wide variety of fresh fruits and vegetables that are culturally relevant to the people who shop there. And for that reason, they, they, uh, they are doing a real service and they provide a great, uh, uh, you know, it's the opposite of a food desert. You have everything you need here. Uh, by the way, they don't charge um, stocking fees or shelving fees. I asked the owner of Viva Fruits if they did that and she said, what, is, what are those? And when I explained to her what they were, she said, well, tell me how I can do that. I'd love to try. <laughs> but, uh, but that said, um, then you have a place like Viva and, you know, practically next door is this uh, shop for Majo Essex. It's among five or six specialty shops in the market. Some of the best in the whole city, um, amazing range of, you know, great cheeses and meats and so on. And they're side by side and everybody who goes to the market can really feel it's for them. And I, and just an, a side note for Maggio, uh, when they moved into the new space, they began to accept EBT as well. And they began to see significant sales. And whenever people, you know, had the opportunity to use the EBT to buy some, a great piece of cheese or some sliced meats, they would buy it. So it just, goes to show, I think there's some preconceived notions about uh, people with lower incomes. They, they just don't necessarily have the money, but they can recognize the value of, qu of quality in food, which is different than, uh, than a luxury brand. It's just about quality. Um, the market as well as a civic space, it has a demo kitchen um, and uh, it's very well used and it's used for things like cooking classes on how to cook and eat on a budget as well as the sort of more foodie events and wine tastings and so on. And, it, and it's constantly booked and, and very much in use all the time. And the mezzanine of the market itself has become a, a gathering space for New York and, and for the neighborhood and for people who come visit. It's again, always, you can go there morning, noon or night. There's people sitting alone, uh, working on their laptop. There's friends, you know, kids meeting after school. And it's, um, and it's a real representation of the city and its demographics and kind of a, re a revival of that print from 19th century New York. You really do see everybody in, in the market. That same feeling you get at, the, at some of the farmer's markets in New York, like this is a Union Square Green Market, which is the biggest and the most popular one. But um, the Green Market is part of a system of farmer's markets in the city. Uh, this is a map showing the extent of that system. And it's comprised of more than 50 farmers markets around all five boroughs of New York. Half of them are open year round. They support a wide number of regional farms. And in the peak of the season, they have a quarter of a million uh, weekly customers and do a million dollars yearly of EBT sales. So while of course it pales in comparison to the industrial food sector, um, it does show the potential of, of uh, things like farmers markets becoming part of a bigger system themselves. And the green market has rules. Here they are, that's 44 pages right now. You can go online and download it yourself and read it yourself and you can approach the green market community advisory board and uh, with any issues or, or questions or problems that you have, the, uh, the way that it's governed is very much tied to the community. I think that's a really important aspect of public markets and why they, there's something that we should be looking at because it's much more direct. Um, looking again at that, at that uh, supply chain, the, of the supermarket, you look at a place like Green Market and they're able to kind of uh, remove themselves a little bit from that supply chain. I mean, some of these items like, you know, medicines and equipment and fertilizer, they're gonna get them from the big uh, consolidated industries, but they're also able to get support smaller businesses, including the um, packers or the slaughterhouses. They, there are a number of independent ones and most of the farmers at Green Market, or I think all of them, uh, rely on those independent slaughterhouses. So they are, you know, they're not completely removed from the industrial system, but they are taking a step away from it. And again, something to um, consider. 
Um, farmers markets like the green market are direct sales outlets uh, where the farmer themselves comes into the city every day or whenever the market's in session to, to sell. But I think uh, in thinking of, um, of broadening the concept of public markets is to look at a place like Essex Market where you also have indirect sales where the, the vendors are all business, small businesses and they are not necessarily in the case of Essex Markets uh, sourcing from small farms, but I think that that potential is there and it's something that hasn't been explored to create more public markets that are more directly tied to regional food systems and the food hubs and so on. I think that it's just uh, hasn't been done, but it's waiting to be done. Uh, how it relates to antitrust is, um, I think, you know, by and large, the, uh, I don't have very specific recommendations, but because I think that, that uh, there's sort of some broad things that we need to do, first of all, first of all, just to recognize that public markets are a form of infrastructure and to think of them as a vital service that, you know, just like a transit system or schools or firehouses, it's something that, especially urban, um, communities, but, but not necessarily only urban, could recognize that public markets could serve a need uh, in their community. Reinvent and revive public market governance, meaning you know, public markets have existed for thousands of years. They have clearly, if an institution has lasted that long and has changed and, and been modified over time. So how can we look at our needs today? There's a lot of interest and attention being paid to the food system and how do we create a better food system Let's look at public markets as a step or a tool to use for that. And how can we create new forms of public markets that can help support uh, new food systems? And finally, to dedicate funding streams, um, you know, I can help it. It's um, as maybe a layperson, I look at, you know, how much money goes to subsidize commodity crops and uh, even uh, the, the meat industry with all of its ills. I would like to see at least some of that money diverted to um, supporting public markets that that don't uh, that are not connected to that food system. So, I think these are the uh, these are the uh, basic thing starting point for rethinking public markets and how they can be of a service to our quest to have a better food system. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Robert. I want to agree with you about the Essex market. I managed to pay a visit there a couple months ago and it was wonderful and some great food and also just amazing ambiance and truly a populist approach. Uh, our last um, panelist for uh, the conference as well as for this uh, panel six is Jay Novin, uh, who is actually going to be talking about building power. Um, it's a wonderful presentation on grocery retail as sites of structure-based organizing, past, present, and future. Over to you, Jay. Golden. Thank you so much, everybody. It's such a treat to be here with my people, the grocery people. Let's do this again sometime, y'all. Um, we've been here all day. If you're like me, you've been riveted by some of these presentations, and also it is late. So if you want to take this moment to maybe put your device down and maybe straighten your back out put your feet squarely on the floor and we can take a just a quick deep breath together breathing in <laughs> through our nose and letting it out through our mouth we are almost there y'all thanks so much to david uh, for helping put this on and austin and austin's mom for really making this all happen <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, shout out to everybody who's just been in support roles, including the old staff at the Graduate Hotel. Shout out to the Amazon plant, who I'm sure is watching this, scanning for what's going on in antitrust. Shout out to the Stop and Shop plant, who's very disappointed about their reputation today. Um, you know, I, I'm, I've been working at a, a nonprofit grocery store. Um, right now, there are volunteers out there running the store in my stead. Um, we've got about 160 folks coming in every week to cooperatively govern that small little retail space in Berkeley, California, and shout out to those volunteers as well. I think I've heard a lot about things that we should do today. 
Um, I think one thing that I've heard some of the panelists struggle with is just like, okay, we have these great ideas, we have these amazing policies. And one of the main questions that I'm trying to answer in this presentation and in this paper and in so much of the work that I do is, how do we actually build a broad-based political constituency to be able to exercise working class power, to be able to get some of these policies through in an environment where it feels ever more difficult to do so? Um, and I think a great place to start would be putting more energy, resources, and money towards grocery store models that build power for those communities. So just a little bit of context. This is a quote from Tyler Cowen, who's an economist who is decidedly on the wrong side of the antitrust debate um, at George Mason University. But even Tyler Cowen agrees that grocery stores are increasingly an organizing and revitalizing force in our cities. I was taking on this role at the grocery store about six years ago and seeing things like Leslie Jones coming back to host Supermarket Sweep and like Aziz Ansari, who we definitely have complicated feelings about, saying like, oh, the best pickup line ever is uh, going to Whole Foods, can I get you anything? Um, and then seeing these like huge long lines of Trader Joe's, I mean, grocery stores are one of the last civic spaces in our society where those spaces have been carved out systematically. And this is a kind of topic in the mainstream that came about in the 90s. We saw the publication of Bowling Alone, which was basically this piece around, oh, people aren't in bowling clubs anymore as an opportunity to speak more about how all different types of civic associations across society over the last 60, 70 years have been plummeting. So these are graphs showing about civic association, which also includes political organizations and union membership. And even Bill Clinton is starting to reference this stuff as early as the 90s. And so what are the consequences of our families and communities all over this country falling apart. Well, um, we, we know, we know what they are. Um, working class people have had fewer organized bodies with which to exercise influence. And we see that union membership has been going down as have real wages. And then of course we have these papers coming out from I think Yale actually saying, oh, oh actually we live in an oligarchy now, sorry. So um, how have those civic associations reacted to a lot of this hollowing out? Well, um, I come from a movement scholarship space. Um, there's a couple of kind of heavy hitters here, including Jane McAlevey, who basically have the thesis that one of the main reasons that we have outside of these influences that are outside of working people's control are that our movements have moved from a model that emphasizes deep organizing and communities, building relationships and speaking with people one on one. That's the no shortcuts part of her book is that we actually have to do the hard work of interacting with people across the aisle or as Jonathan Smucker calls it, beyond the choir, um, and moved towards a, a model of mobilizing. So instead, we maybe have a couple of staff organizers who sit at their nonprofit in DC and send out email blasts and try and move people that are the activists, the people that actually care, as opposed to understanding that we can only exercise working class power to get, get things like antitrust done by having individuals who know individuals en masse and not just the shallow mobilizing efforts. So large civic associations, namely unions, who have been the kind of at the vanguard of a lot of this working class organizing, have said that actually we do need to move back to this level. And starting in the late 90s, you saw that unions were increasingly emphasizing this organizing approach. The famous cleavage between the AFL-CIO and the change to win slate in the late 90s is emblematic of this, where you have increasing parts of the union population saying we need to move into a deeper organizing context because Otherwise, we're just going to fall into business unionism, shallow mobilizing, etc. So the key questions that I'm asking from this part are, how will popular constituencies form to create the political bases for transformative food policies? Basically, like, how are we going to get the people that are down for the ideas that y'all have been talking about to actually show up and force those ideas through? And which organizational forms will constitute the institutional bases for those new beyond the choir organizing space in the 21st century? My answer, in short, is grocery stores. So why grocery stores? Well, because of the ideas that we already talked about, they're one of those last civic spaces in American life, but also we know that this stuff works. 
people have been doing it in social movement spaces for centuries now. A main place where that's happened is in black liberation movements over the 20th century, who of course have been systematically marginalized from this type of literature and organizing. So W.E.B. Du Bois was a huge proponent of using grocery cooperatives and actually invested quite a bunch in, having, uh, in, in actually uh, proliferating them and understood that if we were going to build up broad-based movements for black liberation, there need to, needed to be those institutional homes where people could build up their political organizing skills. Similarly, Fannie Lou Hamer, um, later on in the century, uh, started basically building up this idea of dual power. So we're gonna continue to do the organizing and advocacy on a strictly political level, but we're also gonna use material needs um, as an opportunity to start conversations and do organizing within our communities by providing um, food, basically, in a retail context to uh, the communities that she was working in in the South. Um, poor immigrants in uh, the Bay Area and in Minneapolis and across the country also use consumer cooperatives to do this kind of work. So this is the old Berkeley Food Co-op. They had a membership of about 100,000 people. Uh, they had 12 different grocery stores, 12, $100 million annual revenue. I wrote a thesis about this work when I was an undergraduate at UC Berkeley. And they're the ones that like got the first affirmative action policies in private workplaces in the Bay Area. They implemented expiration dates and then actually use their membership to lobby for that at the state level. Similarly, did boycotts with the UFW and were huge in terms of Cesar Chavez's actual consumer-oriented organizing, and then were the first to sell and then organic and then help implement that uh, policy. Similarly, in Minneapolis, consumer cooperatives were doing the same thing. And similarly, our grocery stores across the country used to be extremely well organized by unions. So they would have the ability to actually mobilize those workers for fair wages and other things in the community. Bodegas also used to be a huge place where that kind of organizing happened. And the beginning of SEIU, one of America's largest unions, actually started on a block by block basis in Chicago using corner stores as a place to actually do that organizing. So there's lots of different precedents here. Um, so what's happening today? Well, a lot of that stuff has fallen out in the years since, especially since the Reagan administration, essentially. Um, we see in the Bay Area um, that there's a lot of exciting stuff. These are two articles from the Chronicle documenting the national rise of the modern food cooperative movement, a lot of energy and consumer and worker owned cooperatives as places to start doing organizing within the broader community. Similar, similarly, student cooperatives have had something of a renaissance over the last 12 years or so, including the location that I work at. This is students doing direct action against Panda Express that was going to move onto the campus. And that grocery store idea, it was an idea at the time, was the thing that actually got them out and mobilized around this issue. We've got mutual aid happening in larger and larger numbers, labor unions using mutual aid practices to start to meet people's material needs in sometimes contexts that look very much like a retail grocery store to start to have conversations deeper about what our community actually wants and how to mobilize them into an action that's going to be sustained where they can take leadership on. Um, we've got some kind of new alternative forms that I think are worthy of exploring in greater depth. This is a town in Florida that when their grocery store closed, took it over from the city, their uh, deeply Republican area, and they've been trying to use that grocery store as an opportunity to invite their citizens into deeper civic engagement, even in places that you'd think might be antagonistic to a municipal owned enterprise like that. And of course, now we're seeing across the country unions using some radical rank and file organizing methods, some really, really radical unions um, organizing with great success at Starbucks across the country. And of course, with King Supers, who just had a really great contract win out of a strike there. So basically, what are the solutions that I'm posing for policymakers and institutional funders? If you're an institutional funder, come see me afterwards. Hello. Um, <laughs> But social movement, uh, social movement organizations should invest in new retail grocery operations. One thing that I don't talk about in this presentation that I talk about in my paper is how a lot of new distributed organizing technological uh, innovations have made this a lot easier, though it hasn't really had the resources to take off in grocery. We at the Berkeley Student Food Collective actually use a model that was pioneered by folks on the Bernie campaign for distributed organizing, which has allowed us to grow and deepen our membership um, in really dramatic ways uh, over the last couple of years. 
Um, but in addition to kind of like activist -y grocery stores, social movement organizations and funders and, and policy people should look into more deeply funding the existing small groceries and other medium-sized markets that we have. You saw in uh, 2017, uh, uh, the Yemeni bodegas in New York City went on strike in protest of some of the Trump administration's uh, immigration policies. And that is an incredible force of folks that are already in control of institutions that might be good for building power that's been systematically neglected by a lot of our social movements. Similarly, um, we should look into different and new institutional forms. We should play around a little bit. Um, you can see that nonprofit groceries are starting to build a lot of attention. You can see these municipal takeovers are also experiencing some successes. Um, and of course, um, unions and worker centers should target grocery stores for rank and file led organizing for their community connections. One of the big kind of things about deep organizing as opposed to mobilizing is that by building up these workers organizing skills and leadership skills, we see that trickle over into the broader politics and social dynamics of a given community. And finally, we should try all of the above and more. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of a quote uh, by abolitionist Miriam Kaba that says, try everything. Um, and this is a great opportunity for folks that do have additional resources, whether that's technical, financial, or otherwise, to start investing in new alternative uh, uh, organizations for grocery stores, um, and ultimately um, see if they can play a part in building the institutional bases for a resurgence of worker power uh, and increased dignified lives for everyone in our communities. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you, Jay. That was incredible and in inc incredibly inspiring as well. Um, so we're going to do some Q&A. Um,